you felt sorry for him. I did. Uh, and the the other fella, you want me to do you? Uh, and the other fella is about five two. I don't think he is any taller than that. Uh, sort of a small guy. And would you know, he lost both legs below the knee. Both. All right. Now, and I and I don't believe they had. Uh, the uh, technology then that they have today, and uh, and I and I can imagine that poor guy. He was probably wheelchair bound, the balance of his life. So, and uh, and, and again, like I said, he wasn't very tall to start with. They're both young, good people, but they were just not not destined to. You know, to to live a normal life, so that was the first two, and they were the worst in a way, because of the injuries that they had. All right, now. And then then we were going into the woods. And there was. I think it was a major at the time. And. I can't think of his name right now. Probably just while I don't. And uh, he was a major, all right? And he was the next to the last man in line, just before me, all right? And he's, he was reading a map, a hand-drawn map, but a map. And he's telling uh, the men where to go. And so we went into we we went in maybe another mile or two miles into the woods, and and all of a sudden uh, the Germans open up uh, and uh, and firing at us. All right, we got us sort of ambushed. All right, so now <clears throat> we were caught and. And the major disappeared. Uh, he disappeared. Uh, apparently, he ran the other way. As a matter of fact, he ended up as a general in the army. Those things happen. So, so anyhow, his, he, he's, he, he, he did all right. But anyhow, there was also an Irishman, I think he was Irish, uh, from Boston. And he told us he had about four or five kids. And he had been working in the shipyard in Boston. And the only conclusion we could come to is that he's probably a Union man, and they probably want to get rid of him. So they made him go into the infantry. They figured they'd get, good, get, get rid of him, all right? And uh, because they didn't want any interference in building ships in, in Bethlehem shipyard, all right? So I, I think that's what happened. But anyhow, we got ambushed, and everybody was running into the woods. Uh, into this clearing from the woods, and they're running in, and I I was I I passed quite a few of them running in, all right, but then someone says a duck, uh, so and so is out there, he's behind the log, and that was the Irishman, and he was frightened to death, poor guy, and so I went out there, and I got him, and I walked him back in and uh, put his arm around my shoulder and walked in it. And, and so that's how I, I got him. I saved his life, at least for that time. And so anyhow, he got in. So, yeah. So then we, we had this battle. And we had, 
we were working on the bitterly cold uh, conditions. Very, very cold, below zero and, and freezing. And there was ice below the snow. And the snow was a foot and a half deep. And there was ice below that. And what had happened, we, we were there fighting for a short time. But what happened <clears throat> was the equipment all froze up. Our armament, the guns, all froze up and they wouldn't fire anymore. And so, uh, well, they were firing. I was alongside of one of the infantrymen, and and I, in that moment, he was shooting at a German, and I was too close to him, and uh, to the infantryman, and uh, and he punched my my right ear, all right, and. And that, that uh, seeped pus for the, all the time I was a POW. So, so that was seeping all the time. But, and I kept on wiping it down, but, but it's seeping. And there's no way I could stop it. So, and that's, so he probably punched my right ear at the time. And, but anyhow, uh, So anyhow, the captain, and the captain was a very, very company C. He was a very, very good man. He had got a lot of commendations and awards and so on. He was a very, very good captain. And, uh, but he decided he was gonna pull out. Our equipment wasn't working. It was all frozen up and so he figured he'd pull out with the able-bodied men, the ones who weren't injured yet. So he pulled out and left me another medic, a medic from Company C. And, uh, and myself, the two of us, uh, were left with 20 wounded men behind because the captain couldn't take the wounded with him. <clears throat> so one of my, my sergeant, one of my sergeants, he was, I thought, very badly wounded. Uh, he had a bad stomach wound. Uh, and he was in a very shallow, uh, Dago, all right. <coughs> and Babcock, his last name was Babcock. B A B C O C K. And I'm a private, and he's a sergeant. He says, Doc, what shall I do? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I, what's gonna have to be? What am I gonna do? I said, well, the first thing you better do, I says, get all your personal papers and photographs and letters, anything you have on you, and get rid of them right away. Because otherwise, if the Germans get you, they're gonna ask you a lot of questions, and you're gonna have to answer to them all. So this way here, they have no questions to ask you. So throw everything away. All right, so he did. All right, and uh, I said, he said, now I said, you better pray. You better pray to, to God, because I don't think you're gonna make it the day. So you better pray. He said, okay. So he listened to me, <laughs> a private, all right. And he was about three, four years older than me. That's all. And so he listened to me, and that's what he did. Uh, and when the Germans came, of course, they, they took him back. Over there. And that was another whole story. 
Uh, but, but anyhow, he, he outlived his captivity. And I guess the Germans took care of him uh, medically. So, so that was good. So anyhow, so that, that was good. But anyhow, uh, and, and then I asked the other medic whether he would, uh, whether he would surrender the men. No, he says, I'm not going to do that. So he wouldn't do it. And then he was a medic for Company C. And I said, well, okay. So I did it. I mean, okay, I got to do it. Someone's got to do it. So now, this is where prayers come in. And I, and I did pray. And I, I knew where the Germans were. And I passed through the German lines. And I es estimated that time there was at least 50, maybe 100. They were dead, right, 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 right at the edge near our lines. Uh, we had killed uh, that day. Uh, and now I had to pass them because, oh, and of course, their bodies were frozen stiff like a piece of lumber or wood. Uh, that's how cold it was. So after 15 minutes of, uh, of being dead in, 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 in that situation, your body freezes up fast and because the blood doesn't circulate, you're dead. And you freeze up like, like a piece of wood. So anyhow, I estimated 50 to 100. I, I didn't count them because they were piled one on top of another sometimes. And I, I, it's very hard for me to count. And I didn't have time to count them either. So, but, I, but there was that many dead Germans. So <clears throat> so as I said, I knew where the Germans were. I had a pretty good idea where they were because I had been in battle that long. All right. So I, I walked through the woods and, and first thing I, then I knew where the Germans were. So I got out of the woods. I started walking up uh, a hill. All right. uh, again, like I said, about a foot, of, a foot and a half of snow or so. I'm walking up the hill and I could actually see my, my spirit was there watching me. Yeah, I could see myself walking up the hill. My spirit was watching me. So, uh, so I got up. I got up to the, the to, to the end of the little hill, I, and there was two big German tanks up there. I, I heard them when I, uh, when I was walking up, because they were rumbling around, moving, and anyhow, they were there. So when I got up the top of the hill where the, where the clearing was, <coughs> and the two, t uh, two tanks were there, and of course they had the two cannon both pointed at me. If they pushed one button, I would have disappeared. All right. But, I mean, they're both, both, both cannons are pointed at me. So anyhow, now this happened, and, uh, and they started to interrogate me. But they had the same problem I had. They couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak German. So we were in pass in that respect. So I had to do what anybody else would do, I use sign language. I said, 10, 20, wounded. I pointed to my Red Cross, and wounded, Americans, you know, and so on, you know. And, and I guess I satisfied them. So then they said, well, keep on going back. So I went back further. And again, I, f I found a company of German infantry. American shells are coming in in the in the Germans, of course, was 
scared to death of the German, of the American shells, all right, because the shells are coming pretty heavy. And <clears throat> now the German sergeant there, he started to interrogate me again. And again, we had the same problem, all right. No, no language, no English, no German. So again, I spoke a sign language and I guess he understood more or less what I was doing or saying. So he asked me to follow him, which I did. We went down that hill and up another hill and, <clears throat> and there was a German uh, uh, headquarters uh, dug into the woods, great big wooden door, all right? So the sergeant knocked at the door and after two or three minutes, the door opened up and who comes out is a German officer in full uniform, like he's going to go on a parade. Uh, and I'm looking at him, boy, beautiful uniform. And, and we didn't have anything like that, of course. And so, so anyhow, uh, and he started to interrogate me. And again, the same problem, third time. Uh, he couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak German. And so we're doing the sign language. And I guess he was satisfied. And he told the sergeant in German, <clears throat> to bring me back up, get a, a squad of uh, uh, your soldiers and follow me down into the, into the area. <clears throat> and, and which they did. All right. So they came down into the area. I, le I led them into the area and they saw the wounded lying around. And I told the wounded before uh, I left to keep their hands in sight, make sure they don't, their hands aren't on any guns or anything like that. And uh, so the Germans don't think uh, it's an ambush of some sort. So we're not, we're not playing tricks on them. And, <clears throat> and so they did. And the Germans started coming in and they started, uh, uh, searching for the men, for the wristwatches and the rings, all right, and and they started to take them, and I started. No, I, I just forgot. I didn't put my rings on, so, so. <laughs> the Germans started taking the rings and the wristwatches and whatever they could grab. And I started jumping up and down like a monkey in a zoo, all right? I said, nine, nine, nine means no, all right? I said, Geneva Convention, Geneva Convention. And they apparently understood what I said because that, they, they stopped and they didn't take any more rings or wristwatches. So at least I had that, all right? And they needed that, because after when the POWs, they had to barter with the German guards for food. So no, the only thing they had to barter with was the rings and the wristwatches, and things like that. So, so they, they had to do, they, they needed those to survive, in which I was able to accomplish that. So anyhow, <coughs> the, uh, that, that evening, before the, it got dark, it got dark around 3 o'clock. So when I say even, I'm talking about maybe about 2.30. Uh, uh, very short days, because uh, of pretty far north compared to what we are here. All right. and <clears throat> so So anyhow, we we they let the the the, the German uh, let us go into the walk into the POW camp. They had a big barn they used for that purpose, and and what I did I I balanced the men up. If somebody had a right leg wound, another one had a left 
leg wound, I put them both together. So the, the, between the two of them, they had three legs, all right? So that's how they walked into the big barn as a POW, and that's how they got in. And I don't remember the sergeant, what, how, how we got him in, but, but, but who, did I, who did I find in the big barn? Was the captain, Captain Denning, uh, the captain of Company C. So he had pulled out and with an able-bodied man and somehow or other he got captured. And, and so he was in the big barn. So I saw him, I had a sh short conversation with him. And, uh, and then <clears throat> I found out later, that some quite a bit later, that six of the men that walked out with Captain Denny, they were caught by the Germans, and they both, I mean, each of them got a, a bullet head, a bullet in the head. Uh, they executed by the Germans. All right. So the Germans were killing half the prisoners. That was just some lucky. The Germans that I surrendered to were not. Uh, very fortunate, very lucky, very fortunate. And, and that's where the prayers come in. And, and so none of us got shot or wounded like that. So, my oldest son. So, uh, so let's see now. So you're in the barn? Hmm? You're in the barn? In the barn. So anyhow, from there we started walking under guard uh, to the German camps and uh, railroad stations or whatever else. And and on the on the way, Uh, that incident that I told you about earlier, about the, uh, the Germans and all the kaput, Fini, no, all is kaput, that's what the express, expression they use. And I answered them, yes, yeah, all is kaput. <laughs> they meant it one way, I meant it the other way. Yeah, and that, that was uh, on the walk. And I had about 40 of us, something like that, uh, under two or three German guards. And, and and we didn't dare uh, leave because we left the, uh, the German population probably would have killed us, so we didn't know what to. We couldn't couldn't leave. And during that time, I got to say one thing. Uh, I don't know uh, exactly uh, what happened, but I do know that uh, we stopped at one spot. I mean, we were gone, and, and uh, some young German boys in uniform, probably Boy Scouts and that sort of thing, uh, they came, uh, or whatever the Germans had, and uh, they came up and they 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 met, and they directed the guards where to go, and we went, and they had one big uh, uh, kitchen, a soup kitchen or whatever, and. Uh, a nice bowl of food, and uh, so we all got a good meal at that time. That's a, the only good meal I really got from the Germans, but that was one of well, that was one of the few good meals I got. I got out of this. All right. So anyhow, so from there we went into a train. They gave us about three ounces of cheese, and that's all. And uh, we were there two or three days in that in that the boxcars, put 90 of us in a, in the boxcar. It's supposed to be 40 men. They call them 40 and eights, meaning 40 uh, people and uh, eight 
Kavax, you know, horses. So it's either eight horses or 40 people. But we were 90 in there <coughs> with three ounces of cheese for about three or four days. So, so they gave us almost nothing. We finally got out. When we got out, we were thirsty as old hell. And of course, there's snow melting here and there and so on. And some men will urinate and some men will drink from puddles. And I was drinking from uh, some puddles, but none of us could had any taste buds anyhow. We didn't know what we were drinking. It could have been somebody else's urine, it could have been uh, water. I didn't know. But I mean, we, we, were, we were that bad. So anyhow, <clears throat> we ended up in uh, one prison camp, which wasn't bad. And I, I think it was near Cologne. And we were there for two or three, no, yeah, three, a few days, maybe a week. And there wasn't, the conditions there were not too bad. So we were there. And then from there, we were, we were put on a, uh, another boxcar, and we went to Bad Orb. Bad Orb was really a hellhole, and I, and I do mean that. And, uh, and it was the, the very same conditions they put us into, into in Bad Orb were the same conditions that they locked up 12 million Jews in the concentration camps without any food or baths or and, and medical attention and so on, you know? And, and six million Jews, of course, died during uh, their, their stay in the concentration camps. Right? And we were under the same conditions, the same amount of food and so on. And uh, in the camp, the last camp I was in, which was really a horrible pla place, it was, <clears throat> we had no toilet. The, they had a, a hole in the camp, in the, in the building, all right, that was supposed to be our toilet. And we all had dysentery, and we had no water, almost no water to drink. We had a very small stream of water for 300 men. There's 250 on each side. I mean 150 on each side. And, and we had no bed, no electricity, and no heat. But other than that, it's a palace. <laughs> And a job of all of that, no baths and no, uh, no uh, toilet supplies and, uh, and, and uh, no change of clothes. Uh, and we were infested with bugs all the time. Uh, World War I, they used to call them cooties. Uh, they, they were lice, that's what they were. Small, tiny lice, each about the size of a grain of uh, rice. Yeah, they're yeah, that, that small. And they infested our clothing up and down. And they were biting us all the time. And so between the, the men trying to go to the toilet in the middle of the night without any lights and probably stumbling on somebody trying to sleep on the floor, um, everybody got disturbed. The, the individual trying to go to the toilet and the ones being awoken, awakened, they're all disturbed. And uh, of course, all the holler and everything. It was just a hellhole. There's not, nothing pleasant about it. So anyhow, that's what happened. And, uh, and, uh, and one of the men from Gloucester was in the same camp I was in. And he, and he died there. And he was there a little longer than I was. But probably lack of food, and medical attention, and so on. So he, he, he didn't, 
he, he was just he was destined to die and he did I mean, he did die there and uh, so uh, one time one, one of the men it's uh, inmates had stolen somebody else's whatever food or something and uh, and I was called upon to be a judge. Um, there was about four or five of us that had a kangaroo court, I guess you might call it. And uh, we told the poor guy that, 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 that there was a uh, perpetrator of the whole thing. We told him, you know, one more time, you get caught again, you, you know, we're going to kill you. And, yeah, okay, okay, and he never did it again. So, so, I don't know if we would have done it or not, but, but we were some upset with him. And, because the food that the Germans were giving us was almost nothing, all right? They, they, they were 20% of the loaf of bread that we had a share among seven people, it was a small German loaf of bread, and <clears throat> and twenty percent of that was sawdust. Imagine giving humans sawdust to eat. All right, and that's the same what the, the same thing they're doing with the uh, concentration camps. They're giving them the same type of food. 20% sawdust. So, and then, and all we got anyhow was a small slice. That's all we got. But, but they, they were, they were, they, really Hitler was uh, uh, the voice of a devil. He was the devil. He was a bad man. And he, he was, there's nothing, nothing, I mean, he's the one that gave orders to shoot the prisoners even, all right? So he had nothing good, nothing good about him. And uh, he, he was just a madman. He was really a madman. And, and it's too bad that the German population had to have him as a leader. But there was... But they, they should have known better. And what can I say? I know it's over. But, and, and, and they didn't. And it's over. I know. But, but, but he is absolutely bad. Uh, and so, can you tell me about liberation? The what? About being liberated? Oh yeah. And the Seventh Army, Seventh, uh, uh, I guess the Army. I don't know, but anyhow, I know it's the Seventh um, uh, Reconnaissance Group. All right, there, there were light tanks, very fast and 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 uh, and light. Not, not heavy tanks. <clears throat> they came in and they, they opened up the doors on the 2nd of April, all right, the day after Easter, I think it was that year. <clears throat> and, uh, and they opened up the doors and they, uh, All right, well, I was going to show you something. Can you show me when we're done? Or do you want to show it on the screen? I can show it to you now. Okay. Shut it off a moment. About a week or two before uh, Easter of that year, uh, they had a mass. And I don't know if the priest was American or German. 
but there was a priest. And we went into this hall, and uh, and they had pews, if I remember, it was pews that, in that hall. And we are supposed to, supposed to be a recitation from the Bible during that time. And the priest told us, well, he says, all of you just sit down. He says, you're not strong enough to stand up. So the recitation from the Bible was something like a half an hour, at least 20 minutes, but I think it's a half an hour. And so we sat down, and that's how we celebrated coming of Easter. Oh, well, we knew. <laughs> the, the Germans uh, had uh, uh, a hall, they call it a recreation hall, but actually in that hall there was nothing in there except um, a radio and a bulletin board, all right? And, <clears throat> and we were allowed to send one American, uh, German-speaking American, into that hall and listened to the news as it came uh, from the German broadcast. And the American was instructed to report the news word for word and not to embellish it in any way. All right, only what the Germans have set, all right? So then we'd go almost every day to, to double check what the news was. Of course, it was all German propaganda, all right? So that was one thing. Uh, and we'd find, according to the, the German news, that the victorious German army had, uh, had attacked or whatever. Uh, uh, the the Americans uh, 20 miles uh, west of uh, uh, Frankfurt, whatever city it was, and and captured uh, so many Americans, destroyed so many American tanks, and uh, and, and and whatever else. Okay. But it always a victorious German army. Uh, and that was 20 miles to the west of uh, Frankfurt. Okay? So then the next day, uh, you'd be 10 miles to the west of, I mean, 10 kilometers to the west of Frankfurt. All right? And they have another tremendous German victory according to the German news. All right. So, and then the next day, you didn't hear anything about the uh, uh, Germans uh, doing anything in Frankfurt. All right. And then the next day, there was a battle 10 miles east of Frankfurt. All right. And of course, the news was uh, not what the Germans wanted to hear, but what we wanted to hear. So they're coming closer and closer. That was fine. And then we had another way of knowing. It was simply looking out the window. All right. Now, that orb was basically uh, a health resort for the Germans. All right because they got warm springs, you know, water coming out, warm springs out of the mountains in that particular area. And so they've always used it as a health resort, all right? And, but of course it wasn't a health resort for us, but, <laughs> but for the German population it was. But anyhow, the, uh,
We were up in the mountains, and we could see for miles away. And when we first looked out the window, we saw flashes of light. And we didn't know, well, being up in the mountains, maybe it was uh, lightning. Could have been a lightning storm or some, some, something or other. All right. And then, of course, uh, we kept on looking day after, uh, night after night, and the lightning was stronger and stronger. And then we started hearing booms uh, indicating shells were being exploded. And, and so now we heard both. And, and of course, we knew the Americans getting closer and closer, uh, despite the German propaganda and uh, what, they were, what they were telling their population. So, and so, so we knew what was going on, and and then of course, it did happen. We did get liberated by the American Seventh Cavalry, all right, and that was good. Now we got, and and as soon as they got uh, liberated us, the next day, they had truckloads of uh, of sea rations. Those are the rations in the cans, okay. And the truckloads of those coming into the camp, and they kept on, they kept on telling everybody, "Don't overeat, don't overeat," because it may kill you. And and some of the men, what they did, they should have what they did. They jump on the trucks, and they start heaving the cases out of the truck and for their own personal use and their friends' personal uses, uh, the sea rations. Uh, and, and of course they were warned against it because of the, the, their physical condition. Uh, well, anyhow, so then after about three or four days of that, um, we we uh, truck loads started coming in. Trucks started coming in to pick us up, to bring us to uh, uh, an area that was maybe about 10, 15 miles away. That was set up by the American Army, and it was a like one huge tent, and they had uh, hot water. Yeah, then a way of having uh, uh, drums of oil uh, drip out onto a hot uh, metal plate and it'll flash up. And somehow or other, they, they, they had it rigged up so that they could generate heat in the hot water, all right? So we had a hot water shower, which is very, very good, and very welcome after, uh, well, a month in the front lines and three months at POW camp. You know, that was uh, a blessing. And, and they gave us, uh, while we were naked, they told us to get a, a rag, because they provided the rags, and gasoline. And we had to co uh, wet ourselves with the gasoline uh, all over our, our hair, uh, whether it's on our head, or under our armpits, or our personal uh, uh, you know, underneath, you know, and you know, wherever they might have been here. So we had a, uh, and that killed the lice, which is a godsend, all right? I didn't realize how effective it was until I used it. And, but it was a godsend, it killed the lice. And so we, not, we didn't see any more lice after that. If we did, they were dead or almost dead. So, but, and they gave us nice clean clothes. They were all used clothes. You know, they weren't brand new, but they were used, but they were on the issue, and they were clean, and they were welcome. And how were you feeling at this point? Well, very, very happy. No question. <laughs> no question about it. Where is it? Very, yeah, very, very happy, and uh, and 
you know, we, we, we know that we had done the very best we could uh, in the military during the time that we were in it. And so we had, for most of us, most, most of us in the POW camp were, were very, very patriotic Americans, no question about it. And we were fully Americanized. And, uh, in every way, but and of course we expected a lot more from the Germans than what they gave us. And uh, as I, I think I described the the, the the living conditions, didn't I? No electricity, no heat, no uh, running water, just a little bit, and no toilet facilities uh, of any kind, including toilet paper. Nothing, and uh, and and food that sometimes I pass by, I wouldn't eat because it smelled so bad. All right, and I and I knew it was gonna do me more harm than good. And uh, when the Germans were, were ladling it out, you know, and I I just go by and with the weakest excuse, and I said, "Well, I'm full today. I don't think I'll eat today," and I just pass by the line and not, not take any, th any food. And uh, so I, I used to do that too once in a while. Uh, because I knew if I ate it, it would probably cause me more harm than good. So why, why do that? So when you got out of the camp, how much did you weigh? Oh, well I weighed, my, my normal weight before I before uh, was about 155 pounds. All right, before I was a POW. And when I got out, I was something like uh, 85. I had an extended stomach that you've probably seen photographs of people that are starving. That uh, that's what happens. The, the stomachs get extended like you're pregnant, you know, and uh, and uh, it's just uh, well, anyhow, that's what happened. So after they cleaned y'all up, um, where were you headed after that? Uh, what, what was that question? After they cleaned everyone up and you had fresh clothing. Oh, Where were you headed? well, they went to the. We, they brought us to the airport. There's a, a German airport that we were using at the time, and uh, they brought us to the airport. My friend and I, my friend uh, Ray Miller, his name was, he passed away, but anyhow, he and I would go into the camp. I mean, to the airport. Uh, in the us whatever they are. And we told them, geez, you got anything to eat here? Oh, gee, we don't have anything. What do you mean nothing? You gotta have something. Well, anyhow, they'd come out with something like maybe uh, bread and butter or uh, something very simple. And uh, and we thought we were in our glory just to get that. And we were tickled to death to get that. But anyhow, we got, <coughs> We got on the airplane, and they flew us from there, I think it was Frankfurt, Germany, to uh, uh, Camp Lucky Strike in, in La Havre, all right? And I upchucked in the plane. I, I, I know I made a mess for some poor guy. I had to clean it up, but I, I did. And I didn't do it on purpose, but I, but I, that's what happened. And, uh, and then we went to like Camp Lucky Strike. And there, I think I told you, we had uh, s six meals a day. I told you that. Uh, and, uh, and that's when I uh, complained to the doctor about my mouth. And he said, don't worry about it. It's normal. OK? So anyhow. Uh, So we're there for maybe a week or two in Camp Lucky Strike, and then we went 
uh, by ship. And I don't remember what the name of the ship was. But we went by Army transport back to the United States. And, <clears throat> and of course, we passed the Statue of Liberty in New York. And a lot of people, were, a lot of the men were running out on deck to see the Statue of Liberty. But I had seen it before. And uh, so I, I wasn't that anxious to get out. Yeah. So, uh, so then from, from there, yeah, almost, uh, I think uh, very soon after that, they gave me two months off, six, uh, eight weeks uh, that, I, that I could furlough, that I could stay home, which I did. And I'd, I'd be eating my poor mother, uh, house at home. I was, I'd sit down for three hours and eat each time. Were your parents aware that you had become a POW? They were practically, uh, uh, they, did, they really didn't get the notice, although I've, I, I, I've, I uh, sent out some postcards. I was allowed to do that maybe three or four. And, uh, but by the time they got the postcards, you know, I had been liberated. Uh, the post was very slow. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I think uh, they, they found out that I wasn't wounded or uh, uh, liberated almost uh, about the time I got home. I was practically home before they, they they even got the notification, so that was all right, and uh, and of course my mother. Uh, so I I would sit down for two or three uh, three hours, and I'd have my friends, uh, civilian friends, uh, come down to join me, and we'd chat. And my poor sisters had to take care of us. They were all younger than I. And uh, they, they didn't want to be tied down so much. They kept all complaining, but it's too bad. We had to eat. <laughs> so we ate and ate and ate. And uh, I did all of that. And it, it took me about two or three months, and I was back to my normal way. And your mouth? Oh, no, it had no problem there. Except, you know what happened after the two months? Uh, they, they gave us uh, uh, two weeks uh, in Lake Placid, New York, which was uh, uh, the, the army had taken it over. It was uh, like a resort area. And we were two weeks there. And I was in, La in Lake Placid and uh, in New York. Oh, so the, doc so the army had give, uh, gave us another physical. So I'm going through the physical, right? And about a few days later, I saw the doctor. That he was passing by. He said, everything all right? I said, yeah, everything's fine. Except, he said, what do you mean? I said, except I'm losing all my hair. He said, you're what? I said, I'm going bald. And I was, <laughs> all right? And I was combing my hair. And uh, great big clumps of hair was sticking to the comb. And so, and I was literally getting bald, all right? And, uh, and the doctor started to laugh like hell, you know? He thought it was so funny I was saying that. And you know what? I was, I was furious with the doctor. I felt like getting up and, and, and hitting the poor man. And, but he was right, and I was wrong. Uh, it was something to be laughed about. It wasn't all that important. So if I went ball-headed at 19 or 20 years old, 21 years old, so what? I mean, I was still alive. So that, that was my experience of Lake Placid, New York. And then, 
Which birthday? 21st. Oh, yeah. Allah's the late blessed of Yaki. Yeah. How come you didn't want to stay in the army? Why? How come you didn't want to stay in the army? Why get out? Well, I wanted to go, go to school and go to college and continue with my life. And I knew no, the army was not my life. And did you make use of the GI Bill? Hmm? Did you make Yes, I did. Yeah. I went under the GI Bill. I went to college. Uh, I uh, graduated from Suffolk University in Boston. And <clears throat> I was a class president in my senior year. And, uh, and a few of my friends and I started the Alumni Association, which they didn't have any at the time. <clears throat> and then about three or four years later, <coughs> they asked me to serve on the Board of Trustees at the university. <coughs> which I did, and of course that mean at that point I wasn't living in Boston, I had to uh, drive to Boston every, every meeting, and they had usually about two, about two or three a week, so it seemed like at least twice a week I used to go to Boston on, uh, on meetings. I was on two or three different committees, and <clears throat> one of the committees I was on was the, uh, um, I guess they call it the Architectural Committee. And, uh, and I was on this committee in the school university had just purchased a building uh, uh, that they were going to convert into uh, 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 classrooms. And so that's and so I was on this committee, and uh, and then I was started asking questions. The next thing you know, they asked me if I'd head the committee. All right, I said, "How about the fellow that's on it now?" The fellow at that time was elderly, like I am now, and he was going around with a walker. And <clears throat> they said, no, don't worry about him. I said, well, you sure? I don't want to hurt him. No, no, don't worry about it. You, we want you to be chairman of the committee. All right, so I'm chairman of the committee. And, <clears throat> and now they had hired uh, as a consultant uh, a man from MIT, and he gave them a lot of input on what to do about the new building. And, <clears throat> and then... The question was, uh, I, I asked the question, well, who's going to be the architect? And they told me it was so-and-so. I said, why? They said, well, he's been doing all the work for the university before, and he's been doing a good job. I said, what's he going to charge? They said, well, 10%. I said, Are you people crazy? He said, what do you mean? I said, it's too much money. Do you think so? I said, yeah. They said, can you do any better? Sure I can. I didn't know. <laughs> so I called a lawyer friend of mine, who was a Boston lawyer, and I said, Charlie, I'm in, well, I put it this way, I said, I'm in deep shit. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I stuck my neck out. He said, what the hell did you do now? You know? <laughs> I said, well, and I told him, he said, what do you want? I said, I need the names of a half a dozen of Boston architects that can do the job. And I told him about the price. Oh, okay. So he gave me the names, the phone numbers of these people in Boston. And so I called about three or four of them. And sure enough, 
I got prices a lot less than 10%. All right? So then we had to negotiate with the, uh, the architect, and uh, one of my committee members that was on the state committee, he capitulated too soon. So I think we got them down to about 8%. Uh, but, but when you're talking about $4.5 million, because I think that's what the builder was, all right? That's a lot of money, all right? So now, so we ended up settling for that. Then about a month, uh, six weeks later, we had another meeting, and this time with the architect and the president of the university and the chairman of the board and myself all right, in the architect's office. All right. And the discussion went around, well, what if we have a subcontractor and he, say, and he gives us a bid of uh, whatever, and he saves a lot of money? Uh, we get it, right? I said, no. He said, what do you mean? I said, that's not fair. He said, what do you mean? I said, it's not fair. I says, if he comes in, he's say subcontractor and he's putting in the uh, electrical, and he saves $20,000. I says, he should get half the money, and we keep the other half. We shouldn't take it all. Does you think we should do that? I says, absolutely. So anyhow, they did. Uh, they took my advice on that one. And... Yeah, I was working for my father at the time on fish, right? And I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning, be at work at five in the morning. Uh, those days, so so anyhow, that's what what happened. So anyhow, by that time, the builder had started, and they t they took my advice. And about a year or two later, I was off the board. I mean, off of that, yeah. I was no longer a trustee, let me put it that way. And <clears throat> but about uh, 1984 was exactly, they gave me a phone call from Boston. You know, a friend of mine, he, he said, Mike, they want to know if you'll accept the trusteeship. from the university. I said, get out of here. I said, I'm, I'm kind of busy. Don't bother me. And I was kind of busy. He said, no, no, and he said, I'm serious. I says, only if, I said, I'll believe you. I said, if I get a letter from the university on the, uh, sent by the president of the university on school stationery, asking me to do so. So I did. All right. So I, I got the letter, all right. And so now they wanted me to be a trustee. So I told my mother. <clears throat> my mother, she's from the old school, and she didn't have a lot of education. And my mother probably had gone six, seven grades in school. And then she had to help her mother because her mother was elderly and, not, and, and rather frail. So, so she didn't. So she didn't know what I was talking about. I said, "Ma," I said, "They offered me a trusteeship, an honorary tr tr uh, trusteeship, Do no honorary doctorate at the university." A what? She says, "How the children?" I said, Are "You kidding?" I said, "Do you hear what I said?" She said, "Your eyes don't look so hot." <laughs> I said, "Ma." I says, the honor, they're gonna give me an honor, all right, of an honorary doctorate at the university. And she, no, I don't know if I could come. I said, what do you mean come? Because now the poor woman was suffering with the Parkinson's and she had to use a walker, my mother. And she says, no, people will laugh. They, they will laugh at me. I says, I don't give a damn what the hell they do. You're gonna come, you're gonna be there. So anyhow, I, I had to actually force her into it. And I got around uh, a dozen seats, uh, reserved seats in the front row, all right, the auditorium, all right. 
And, and fortunately for me, who was up there was Archbishop Cushion, who later became a cardinal, and now he's in Rome. All right. And, but he was up there, and she recognized him. So once he was up there, now this is something of importance. All right. <laughs> so that that's how that day went. <laughs> and and uh yeah, my poor mother, she was going down the aisle bitching like hell. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, who is it? Come in. What'd you say? Yeah, we'll be down a little bit. Not now. Oh, that one there, yeah. Now, what had happened, uh, this is before, really, I got into, yeah, I don't think, it was near the beginning of my uh, uh, infantry uh, involvement, you know, in the, the war, and near the beginning. Uh, and I had a duty, one of my duties was after a barrage, after a German barrage of the area, that was to walk around and, and see how the men were, make sure everybody was all right, nobody's wounded, and so on. If they were wounded, I had to take care of them. All right. And <clears throat> so I was going along, and I saw this young man. He might have been about my age at the time, maybe 18, 19 years old. And uh, he was lying down, dead as could be. All right very dead. And his eyes were wide open, but still sparkling. And <clears throat> he hadn't been dead maybe a few minutes. Uh, and, and of course he's facing upward. And, <clears throat> and whatever happened, uh, he's facing upward and he was laying down, his helmet was off, his uh, steel helmet was off, and, and, he had, and his, his head was open over here. All right, and his brains were sticking out about two or three feet from his body, all right, a couple of feet. And, <clears throat> and I looked at him and I, I knew what, was hap what the situation was. And we had what we call the, the Graves Registration, which actually was part of the medical corps. Uh, they, they, didn't, they didn't practice medicine in any way. But their job was to register the, the dead and to bury them. That was their job. But they had done so much of that that they were very casual about the whole thing. Uh, and they treated every, all, all the dead like a piece of wood or junk, all right? And they just throw them on the truck, throw them on the truck, all right? And, and sometimes if they had too many dead and uh, their arms were sticking out or something, they'd break an arm off just to throw them in so they fit in the truck. So I mean, they were pretty uh, lackadaisical about the whole thing, all right? And I didn't want this poor fellow to, to suffer that. So what I do, I, I start practicing medicine, all right? <laughs> As being a brain surgeon, all right? So I, I took his brains and I put them back in his head uh, the best I could, all right? And then I bandaged him up uh, around the, uh, the whole thing so, uh, so everything would stay together. <clears throat> then I put his helmet back on and so, so it looked like he was normal. And I left them like that. And that's what I did. So I was practicing brain surgery at 19. <laughs> and no overcare neither. <laughs> and so what would you say is your most memorable experience of World War II? Well, 
I don't know. I don't know. I'd say for one thing, the day we, we got deloused and washed and we took a shower, that was probably one of the best days I had, of course. And it was. And of course, the other days when I when I was with my friend, uh, uh, Ray Miller, we we eat six meals a day. I think I told you that. <laughs> adjusting back to civilian life after being a POW and being in combat? I did it very well. I, I had no problem. Did you ever dream about being a POW? Did I ever dream? I think about it all the time. Being a POW, being in, in, uh, uh, in combat and all of that, and, and the poor men that I took care of. And uh, matter of fact, I say a prayer for them every day. The, the, uh, it was, it was a, these men, I felt this especially bad for the men that had uh, wounds that were very de debilitating, very bad wounds, all right, like uh, loss of limbs, or, or the, the other one that I described about losing his whole whole face. But all, all of these uh, men, when you think about it had to live the balance of their lives in, 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 a, in a very, very uh, awkward, un, un, uh, 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 very awkward way, all right? And, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people that haven't been through that uh, probably wouldn't be sympathetic. And, and they would think maybe that individual that was was uh, putting it on, so to speak, but 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 when you lose a, a limb, I mean I I I just think about it every day. I I'm, thank God I've got my my facilities, and uh, I can use my hands and I can use my legs. Uh, they're not not nearly as fast as I used to be, but I'm 92, so I can't complain. All right. And, but, I, I, I have everything, and including my my uh, my mental capacities are still here, and I I don't I don't like I don't like that either. So, but a lot of people my age either don't re reach my age, or they get incapacitated, one way or the other. Uh, and of course, I I feel especially bad. For all those, especially those that were in the service, they got uh, debilitating wounds that they couldn't couldn't function normally anymore. Whether they couldn't walk or they couldn't, uh, 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 their arms were gone or whatever else, or, or they had whatever. If they had real bad wounds and, and they suffered, who knows, maybe one year or maybe 20 or 50 years more uh, with those wounds. Uh, is, is a very, it's a very, very sad thing to even think about. Yeah, and I feel bad for them. So how would you say that World War II changed your life? Well, I'd say the biggest change, the biggest thing that impressed me, that I've that I've done, is that 
I, I've written a story on it, and I think I've given you part of it. And I found that in life, that if you want something, you have to go after it. And you can't just lay back and, and think that somebody is going to give it to you. Because it doesn't happen that way. Everybody's got their own concerns. And what they think is important may not be what you think is important. So the, the best thing to do is if you need something or you want something bad, you go after it in every way you can. In, in every, uh, let's say, Christian way you can. Okay? I don't mean in an unchristian way, but I mean it's a, about... But be persistent and, and get it done. You want it done? Get it done. And why would you say that you decided to serve in World War II? Why? Well, the first thing is if you got rejected, there's a stigma. All right? The stigma was being called a 4F. <laughs> That's what they used, used to call it. And 4F meant basically you, you weren't fit for military service. <clears throat> and I didn't want to be in that position. And what does your service during World War II mean to you today? Well, actually today, I'm in a very lonely position because there's only one or two percent of the World War II veterans still al alive. And, and and most of those one or two percent are probably incapacitated. And and I'm not I don't have those that burden. So I'm not my, my facilities are here and I can do most everything that I, I used to do. Not as fast, you know, not as quick. You know, and and I do have my small ailments, but I I I'm blessed. I'm still blessed, and I and I can't complain. All right. Um, final question: uh, Do you think it's important for there to be institutions like the National World War II Museum? Oh yes, absolutely. People should know what what transpired. In, in past generations. And why do you think we should continue to teach World War II to future generations? So that we won't repeat them. If, his, if history is taught and people understand it, then there'd be less likelihood of us repeating it. So so another, 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 to be a stress-free world, stress-free world, we should know what happened in the past and avoid the mistakes if possible. And maybe some of them can be avoided. Those are all of my questions. If you have any, anything else you want to add today? No, I... I, I'm, there's not much. <laughs> I think I've probably bored the hell out of you. <laughs> no? That's why we ask at the end if you have any stories that perhaps I didn't touch on, an area that... Well, I just gave you a whole story there. Did you read that one? the World War II Memorial. Yeah. yeah. Did you read it? Mm -hmm. Finish it? You see what the, the, the whole thing? Uh, uh.